Greetings. Welcome to the third lecture on noise. I am Beza Rozavi, and today we will talk about analysis of noise in different circuits and also the representation of noise in circuits. So, what I would like to accomplish today is uh, uh, introduce a procedure for analyzing noise in circuits so that we have a methodical step-by-step -step, uh, uh, system that allows us to calculate the noise of in any circuit. Uh, then I will uh, uh, use this analysis to try to predict the noise behavior of some circuits and we'll see that in doing so we uh, see the need for the concept of input referred noise voltage quantities and eventually also input referred noise current quantities. And with these two input referred noise sources, we can represent the noise of any circuit. And then uh, we will also address some complications that arise in uh, developing these concepts and see how we go around them or how we resolve them. Okay, so <clears throat> before we delve into today's lecture, let's just uh, talk about a few concepts that we have seen in the past few lectures. Uh, these are critical for our understanding, our analysis. Uh, the first one is the theorem that I introduced before, namely uh, the relationship between the output spectrum and the input spectrum of a linear time invariant system. We said that if we have the input spectrum and we have the transfer function of the system H of S, then the output spectrum is equal to the input spectrum times the magnitude squared of the transfer function. So we saw that this, in a sense, shapes the input noise. If the input noise is subjected to some sort of response like this and assumes this shape at the output. Okay, uh, the other concept was uh, the modeling of device noise, the noise of the different devices. We saw that we modeled the thermal noise of a resistor by a voltage source in series with it, and the spectrum of that voltage source is white with a density of 4 KTR from zero to infinity. For the MOSFET, we saw two types of noise. The thermal noise was modeled by a current source between the drain and source terminals with a spectrum also flat, also white, given by 4 KT gamma GM. And also flicker noise, we had uh, modeled as a voltage source in series with a gate. And the spectrum of this voltage source was given by this equation, which has a 1 over F dependence. And it's called sometimes 1 over F noise. So with this in mind, now we can go ahead and analyze noise in different circuits. So how do we go about doing that exactly? If we are given a very complex circuit, and we are asked to see what type of noise perform performance we can get from the circuit, how do we go about doing these calculations? Well, uh, there's a simple procedure that we can follow. First, we go ahead and identify all sources of noise in the circuit. We know that the transistors have different types of noise, the resistors have thermal noise, so we go ahead and represent each of those by some sort of voltage source or current source whose spectrum is known. That is the first step in the procedure. Then uh, we find the transfer function from each of these sources to the output while the input is set to zero. The input, if it's, if it's a voltage source, is a short circuit. If it's a current source, is an open circuit. So we find the transfer function from, for example, Vm3 to Vout, from Vn1 to Vout, etc., one at a time. Now we invoke that theorem I showed you. So we say that the output noise due to, for example, Vm3 is given by the spectrum of Vm3 multiplied by the magnitude squared of the transfer function from Vm3 to Vout. So we can calculate the effect of each noise source at the output. So we obtain a whole bunch of output noise components, one from this guy, one from that guy, and so on. Now, if we know that these noise sources are uncorrelated, we can add up their 
uh, results at the output. So we add up the powers at the output, the spectra at the output, and that will give us the total noise that this circuit produces when its input is set to zero. And of course, that's what you would see in the lab as well. In the lab, you can take a spectrum analyzer or some sensitive device, connect to the output of the circuit, and try to measure the output noise of the circuit. Okay, so as long as we have this procedure, then it's more of a mechanical operation. We just go around and uh, one by one perform these steps, and we will find the final total output noise. All right. So, uh, pictorially, this is what happens. We have an actual circuit with a bunch of noise sources in it. And after going through this procedure, we end up with one giant noise at the output, the sum of all these noise components. So what we can say is that now the circuit of interest is, now that we have calculated this output noise by setting the input to zero and calculating all of these and adding them up, we can say that the circuit of interest is now noiseless. So you can see that I set this to zero, it became a short circuit. I set this to zero, it became an open circuit, right? We removed all sources of noise. And the only noise we have is a voltage source at the output, which is equal to the noise that we just measured here. So we have the noiseless circuit, and to the output we have added the noise voltage equal to this. And now I claim that this circuit and this circuit are indistinguishable. Right? If we apply an input signal here, an input signal here, and we measure the signal and the noise at the output, these two will be exactly the same. So that's a repre representation that we can work with. We can represent the noise behavior, behavior of the entire circuit by one noise voltage in series with the output, if the output is a voltage quantity. Okay, that's great. So let's uh, try to apply this to some simple circuits. Uh, we have a common source stage with an ideal noiseless current source. So the only noise that we have is due to M1. And let's just consider the thermal noise of M1, not flicker noise. Okay, well, the first step was to identify the sources of noise. So the source of noise is this noise current connected between drain and source with a spectral density of 4 kT gamma gm. That's good. Then uh, we need to find the transfer function from this noise source to the output voltage. Well, in this case, it's simple. Uh, this current flows through the output resistance of the transistor. It has nowhere else to go and generates the output voltage. So the transfer function from this current to this voltage, voltage just RO. To obtain the output noise, we multiply the input spectrum, the spectrum of this noise source, by the magnitude squared of this transfer, transfer function, and that gives us 4 kT gamma gm RO squared. So that is the noise voltage at the output, the spectrum of noise voltage at the output of this simple common source stage assuming that M1 is in saturation, of course. Very well. So that's easy enough, but then uh, looking at this equation, I asked myself, how do I optimize this circuit for noise? So again, do I want to maximize GM or minimize GM? Remember we asked this question last time in conjunction with a single transistor. Now we ask the same question in conjunction with this common source stage. Okay, well, if you remember, last time we said if some signal is passing through the transistor, then we should really look at not just the noise at the output, but also the signal at the output and see what happens to the signal to noise ratio as we play with GM. So here are two scenarios. I pick the, uh, the transconductance of this device to be GM or 2GM, and I would like to know what happens. Well, the output noise voltage does go up by a factor of 2 when GM is doubled. But then what happens to the signal power? Okay, well, we know that this signal will be multiplied by GM as it becomes a current at the output. 
and is multiplied by GMRO as it becomes a voltage at the up because the voltage gain is minus GMRO. So I will take the spectrum of the input, multiply it by GM squared RO squared to produce the output voltage resulting from the signal. So that would be GM squared RO squared V in squared bar. That's the signal power. And the noise power at the output is 4 kT gamma GM RO squared. So this RO squared cancels with this RO squared, and we end up with a simple equation here. So we see that the signal to noise ratio at the output is given by a V in squared bar, that's the spectrum of the input, multiplied, multiplied by GM over 4 kT gamma. So to maximize the signal to noise ratio at the output, I will need to maximize the GM. Okay, this is because the signal propagates through the device. From other perspective, what we can say is that increasing GM increases the output noise power, but it also increases the output signal power more rapidly, because this would be GM squared RO squared times the input, whereas here is GM. So the noise goes up more slowly as GM increases uh, than the signal power, so that's why it's preferable to increase GM for maximizing signal to noise ratio. Okay, so by the same token, we can say that if the transconductance is 2 GM, then uh, the signal to noise ratio is 2 GM over 4 kT gamma times V in squared bar. All right, so that's great. That uh, gives us some understanding of how to uh, choose the device dimensions and bias currents. Uh, but uh, before we leave the slide, uh, we have to ask ourselves, so we decided that by just looking at the output noise, we don't have the entire picture. We decided to look at both the signal power and the noise power at the output. In other words, the signal to noise ratio. Now, do we have to do this for every circuit? Because just by looking at the output noise, we don't see all the things that are going on. Well, maybe what we can do is, instead of looking at the noise at the output and the signal at the output, maybe we can look at the signal and noise at the input of circuit. So that brings us to what we call the input-deferred noise. And the input-deferred noise simply means that take the output noise and divide it by the gain from the main input to the output. The gain could be a voltage gain, for example. So divide by the gain. And you have to divide by the gain squared if this is a power spectral density, if it's a power quantity. <clears throat> so, in other words, our objective is as follows. I have a noisy circuit with all these noise sources in it. And with the input set to zero, it has a certain noise at the output. I would like to recreate the scenario, <clears throat> uh, but with a noiseless circuit and not with a noise source at the output, but at the input. So I want this output noise to be the same as the output noise. I want to have no noise inside the circuit, so I have a noisy device here. So we can intuitively see that this noise voltage multiplied by the gain from here to here squared will give me this noise. So what I will do is I will find the output noise, as we did before, I will divide it by the gain squared, meaning I refer to the input, and I will call the result V and N squared bar. So by doing so, we have eliminated the gain from our equations. And as a result, we can make fair comparisons between one circuit and other circuit. Uh, with the, in the previous slide, when we looked at the output noise, the problem was that we had uh, uh, we have to include the gain for the signal quantity. But once we refer it to the input, we don't have to worry about the signal anymore because the signal would appear here with a gain of 1. So now we can just look at the noise because this noise directly corrupts the input signal. Okay, as an example, let's go back to our resistive divider, which we analyzed in the previous lecture. And recall that the output noise was given by 4 kT 
R1 in parallel with R2. And we know that the voltage gain is R2 over R1 plus R2. So uh, that allows us to take this output noise and divide it by the square of this quantity to refer to the input. And that comes out to be like that. This is the input referred noise voltage of the resistive divider. And uh, this gives us some guidelines for choosing R1 and R2 to minimize the noise, per the, to improve the noise performance of the circuit. It says we need to minimize R1, right, for minimizing this, or maximize R2. And if you remember, these were the same guidelines we developed last time by looking at the signal to noise ratio at the output of this divider. So the results are consistent and sensible. Okay, moving on, uh, let's look at another example. And uh, this is the common source stage we just analyzed. We found the output noise voltage spectrum for KT gamma GM R squared. We found the signal to noise ratio at the output. And now we would like to find the input referred noise voltage. So the procedure is simple. We find the total output noise. In this case, we have only one source of noise, so that's what we get. We divide this by the voltage gain squared to refer to the input as a voltage quantity. So when we divide this by the voltage gain squared, which is GMRO, GM squared RO squared, we end up with this equation. So this is divided by GM squared RO squared. RO squared goes away. We end up with a GM in the denominator. So the input referred noise voltage of this, device, this circuit, common source stage, is given by 4 kT gamma over GM. And that uh, uh, brings us to this representation of the circuit. So the beauty of this is that it shows the corrupting effect of the noise directly upon the input signal. So we don't have to worry about the gain from here to here. Because from here to here, uh, this noise and this signal experience the same gain. So the signal-to-noise ratio calculated here is the same as calculated at the output. And that's, the, that's why this representation allows us to compare different designs or different circuits. And obviously it says that as you increase GM, the noise performance improves. Okay, uh, just to have a feel for numbers, if we assume that 1 over GM of this device is about 50 ohms, then as we saw before, the input referred noise is about 0.91 nanovolts per square root hertz, assuming that gamma is about 1. So again, that's a good number to remember. Whether this amount of noise is acceptable or not depends on the situation. For example, if it's a low noise amplifier for RF applications, this is too much. But for some other applications, it might be OK. OK, so uh, that's what we have so far. Uh, but uh, we still have some complications. Let's go back to our simple resistive divider. We uh, modeled the input referred noise uh, by this voltage source and uh, with the spectrum. So that's good. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is consider some extreme cases and see uh, whether this model is accurate all the time. It seems that it should be accurate. We didn't make any approximations anywhere, right? But let's just see. Okay, let's assume that the input port of this circuit is left open. Now, if you don't like an open circuit, assume it's just a very, very high impedance compared to R1 plus R2 or R2 or something like that, right? Okay, so now if the input port is left open, we ask ourselves, how much is the output noise? All right, so we're going to calculate that in two different ways. Number one, using this model. This model presumably is a good model, right, because it modeled the noise of both of these transistors as one voltage source in series with the input. Well, this model says that if this port is left open, 
of if it's tied to a very high source impedance, the output noise will be zero. Why? Well, because if the impedance looking in the space is very, very high, we cannot have any finite current through this network resulting from this voltage source. Right? Or you can think of it this way that this voltage source gets divided by a very large number if it gets if it's uh, if we have a divider using this source impedance and these two resistors. So in any case, the current resulting from this voltage source in this network will be extremely small because the source impedance is very, very high. And that means that the output noise will be zero, will be very close to zero, because uh, that very small current times R2 will give us a very small voltage. So in the limit, when the input port is left open, the output noise is zero. That's what the model says. But the actual circuit doesn't do that. The actual circuit says, well, if you leave this open, what we have is R2 connected to ground, right? R1 is gone, R2 is there, R2 produces noise of 4KT R2, so the noise should be 4KT R2. So we have a discrepancy between the model that we developed before and the actual circuit in this extreme case. In fact, what we can observe is that if the source impedance connected to this port goes from infinity to zero, for the actual circuit, this is what happens. When the source impedance is infinity, the output noise voltage is 4KT R2. Whereas when the input port is short-circuited, the source impedance is zero, the output noise is 4KT R1 in parallel with R2. Both of these make sense. So in this circuit, the output noise that we measure depends on the status of the input port, meaning it depends on the source impedance driving the input port. If the source impedance driving the input port is very, very high, the output noise is different from when the input source driving the circuit is very, very low. So if you think about it, this can only happen if the input impedance of the circuit is not infinity. If the input impedance of a, of a circuit is infinite, then the output noise should not depend on whether the input port is shorted or left open. Because no current flows through the input port anyway, the rest of the circuit has no feeling about whether we are keeping that port shorted or open. In other words, this discrepancy arises because the input impedance of the circuit is not infinite. Okay, so how do we fix the situation? Well, there's a simple fix for it, and that fix is to add a noise current as well. And that's shown here. So we see that we have a noise current added to the uh, input port, and uh, with these two, it turns out that we can model the noise of any circuit with any sort of input impedance. Now, the procedure for finding these two sources is relatively simple. We take the circuit to one of two extreme cases so as to eliminate the effect of one of these sources. And that's what I mean. Uh, imagine that we are interested in calculating this noise voltage. Okay, well, we will short the input of the actual circuit. When we short the input, we also short the model, the input port of the model, so this point goes to zero, and we have this uh, the bottom terminal of V and in to, uh, to ground, for example. Now, we see that in this case, in this extreme case, when the source impedance driving the circuit is zero, the current that models the noise is out of the picture, simply because uh, this noise voltage determines the voltage between these two points, and this current has no role whatsoever in what happens to the circuit. So in the case of a short circuit at the input, we have the conditions for calculating the input effect noise voltage uniquely and easily. So we did this before, right? We shorted the inputs, we calculated the output noise, and we divide the output noise by the voltage gain to find this noise voltage. From another perspective, we can say we pick this noise voltage such that the output noise of the noiseless circuit 
is the same as the output noise of the noisy circuit. Now for the current noise, we go to the other extreme and we leave the input port open. So when the input port is open, uh, in the model, this voltage source has no effect anymore because it cannot create any current in these branches. So that's out of the picture. And what's remain, what remains is only the input noise current. So now we say that this noise current has to be such that when it propagates through the noiseless circuit and generates the output noise, this output noise is equal to this output noise, which we call Vn2 to distinguish from Vn1. Another way of saying it is that we take the output noise that we have calculated in this condition with the input open and divide it by some gain squared. What is that gain squared? Well, it's not a voltage gain because we're going from current to voltage. So from voltage back to current, we have to divide it by a trans impedance gain. A trans impedance gain is one that relates an input current to an output voltage. Okay. All right, so now if we repeat this analysis for the resistive divider, we end up with this little noise current here, which is from R2, 4KT over R2. Because to capture the noise current, we have to leave the input port open. If, they leave, if we leave the input port open, this voltage source is out of the picture. This resistor has no role in the circuit. Uh, so the output noise is simply given by this current times this resistor. And that's why we end up with 4KT over R2. Very well. So that shows uh, how we go about calculating the input different noise sources of a given circuit. Now, uh, of course, the existence of two sources makes things cumbersome. We have to calculate Vn and In for any circuit that has a finite input impedance. So that's a sort of a painful process. But uh, we naturally ask, under what conditions can we neglect the effect of the noise current? So here's a, a quick snapshot of what the circuit could look like and how we try to estimate the effects of these noise sources and then if we can make an approximation. All right, so we have the circuit of interest here. It has a finite input impedance, remember, if the input impedance is finite, then we need a noise current in addition to a noise voltage for the input. But at the same time, uh, this entire circuit is also driven by some other preceding stage that has some sort of source impedance or output impedance, which we model by ZS. Okay, so now I would like to find the total noise at point X and then see under what conditions the effect of IN is negligible. So that's not that hard. What we will do is we say uh, this noise source here, the noise at node X is given by the effect of VN divided between these two impedances and the effect of IN, IN multiplied by the parallel combination of ZS and ZN. In a sense, we're using superposition. This is just Ohm's law, or, or KVL and KCL, right? So it's as simple as that. Okay, now what's interesting is that what we see here is that to, for this term, which results from IN, to be negligible with respect to this term, we need to satisfy this condition. So interestingly, the input impedance of the circuit actually does not come into the picture. What does is the source impedance driving the circuit. So we would like the noise current times the source impedance squared to be much less than Vn. If that's the case, then we can neglect the effect of In. If not, then we have to include it. Now, what makes things more complicated is that uh, Vn and In are actually correlated in many cases because they reflect the same, some of the mechanisms, uh, both uh, that relate to the circuit. For example, it's possible that the noise of a resistor appears in both uh, this Vn and this In, which means we cannot uh, assume that they are uncorrelated. Okay, so how do we deal with this correlation? 
Well, one could deal with correlation if one wanted to, but there are some workarounds. One possibility is that if the input impedance of the circuit is low enough or the output impedance is high enough, as we saw here, that IN is not negligible anymore, then uh, we can try to look at the previous stage and the stage as one entity and then try to uh, model the noise of this entire system. That's one approach. Another approach is to say, well, actually, we won't refer the noise to the input. We'll just stay at the output. We calculate the total noise at the output. We calculate the total signal at the output and deal with it as such. So these are some simple approaches that we can use. All right, this uh, concludes uh, our lecture today. I will see you next time.